again. Tina Koto, Kata, welcome everybody to the um, Community Liaison Group for Wellington Water and South Wairapa District Council and the South Wairapa Community. Um, it's great to have so many attendees here. It's a really um, important initiative and a great chance to increase lines of engagement for the community in this really important area. Um, we are a really large group here. Um, I can see um, all sorts of people who would probably take us quite a long time to introduce ourselves individually. A really helpful thing for everyone to do, if they haven't already, would be to just float their mouse up into the top right corner and rename themselves if possible with their name and their role plus their organization. That would just help everyone um, keep track of who's who during the meeting. Um, we're also going to just start with the Wellington Water team introducing themselves because they're really important here and probably the least known within this group. So we might just do a round robin around the Wellington Water team starting with you Rory. Yeah hi everyone um, thanks for everyone for attending. Uh, the, so my role is the um, Senior Communications and Engagement Advisor uh, for Wellington Water. So um, my focus area is uh, South Wadarapa, um, just letting in Nadida Nere, actually. Um, yeah, so my, again, my focus area is South Wadarapa. Um, so I'm su supporting the team with this particular community engagement um, here. So um, yeah, that, that's my role and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's me. Um, Shall I go next? Shall I tag yeah. team? Through tag team, Andrew. Kia ora yeah, just tag teams, it's hard to tell which order everyone's in. Yeah. Kia ora Ko uh, Tanya Haskell Topo Ingoa. I am the General Manager of Network Development and Delivery for Wellington Water, and I also am the owner of the relationship with the South Wairarapa District Council. Um, how about you next, Gillian? Hello, my name is Gillian Woodward. I am the manager of treatment plants for Wellington Water. That is for our in-house treatment plant operations, which includes all eight treatment plants in the Southern Wairapa district. Martin. Evening, everyone. Uh, Martin Gromack, I'm the treatment team leader in South Wairapa. So I um, oversee a team of four operators that uh, is spread across uh, yeah, four water and four wastewater treatment plants in the district. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, no whakatū ahau, ko takaka toku maunga, ko motuweka, motuweka toku awa, uh, ko Adam Madsen toku ingoa, uh, ko Kate toku huaranga tērā, ko Lucy raua, ko Bella aku tamahine, uh, ko Paito Mokai Toku Kainga, Ke Wellington Water Aho e Mahiana, He Program Lead uh, South Wadarapa Aho. Yeah, kia ora everyone. Um, I'm originally from uh, Nelson. Uh, Takaka is my mountain and uh, Motueka is my uh, river. Uh, my name is uh, Adam and uh, I live with my wife and two girls uh, in uh, Featherston. Um, and uh, so, as I introduced, my, I'm the program delivery lead uh, at Wellington Water, and I oversee the capital delivery program for for South Wairarapa. Um, so, um, yeah, I've got a couple of slides later on. We'll introduce a little bit more what we might be doing. Um, Noreira, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. Hand over to Amy. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Smith. I'm a senior process engineer in the network engineering team at Wellington Water. So I've been working with these treatment plants and just understanding how they're performing over the last few years. Thank you. Let Martin be best next, is it? I think that leaves us with Richard. Is Richard around? Yeah. I don't think he's okay there, Richard. No, I'm not sure if he's on the line. No. 
Okay, is that the, the everyone in attendance from the Wellington Water team? We might just go back to you, Tonya. Um, probably should have done this just before. Apologies, everyone. Tonya, if you could um, come in now with an opening karakia just to set the tone. Kara, Andrew, um, I would like to share our Wellington Water Taki for our opening karakia. Hey, why, hey, why, hey, why, heading a tangata, hey, why, heading a whenua, hey, why, rua, hey, why, ora. Tihei Māori Ora. Kia ora. Um, just double checking, is, is there anyone in the wings from Wellington Water that I've cut off there? Okay. Yeah, Thank I'm you. Not, I'm not sure what's happening with Richard there, Andrew, but... Um, That's uh, okay. Yeah. If Richard pops on next, and also, um, I think with a big group, as everybody speaks, um, please do make sure that you almost reintroduce yourself with your name, your role, and your organisation, just because I find these really big meetings so much more helpful if you can clearly place people of where they fit and not get it jumbled. So I know people are wearing a few hats. So like a, a very briefly, just to, um, I guess we'll come to you now, Tonya, with setting the scene of the CLGs. Every minute, Tonya, I'll just get. Thanks, Rory, to just drop down. So I just, um, we firstly wanted to introduce uh, Wellington Water because um, we've been looking after South Wairarapa's water since 2020. And um, so therefore we picked up, you know, ownership and running of the CLG meetings. Um, a lot of people don't really understand how we work, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview. And if you've got any questions, you can fire them through Andrew and I can answer them outside of the meeting. But what we are is a wholly council-owned organisation. We're run by six councils across the region. There are the um, four metropolitan cities in Wellington. There's the Greater Wellington Regional Council and South Bairarapa District Council. So in the current model, each council owns each all of their assets, and we manage them on their behalf as their trusted advisor. Um, our governance is interesting. We've got a Wellington Water Board, so Board of Directors, that kind of manages how we operate as an organisation. And then we've got the Wellington Water Committee, which has got um, either a mayor or a councillor from each of those, um, of the six owners, plus uh, Tangata Whenua representatives. We have two currently, and we're aiming to get a third from Wairarapa joined shortly, which is awesome. And then effectively what we do with the assets, so for South Wairarapa, for example, we run and manage the assets on your behalf. So the budgets are set by councils, and then we do what we can with those budgets. So we maintain your stormwater, drinking water, and wastewater assets, um, and they, whether they be pipes in the ground or the plants, which is what we're gonna talk about today. We're also um, responsible for customer interactions and maintenance of the network, and you'd have heard a bit about that lately. Um, and then our other role, which is an important one, as we lead into water reform, is around strategy and planning. What does the future look like for South Wairarapa and what are the things we can do to take you into that future? Great, thanks, Tonya. And, and he's going to talk about the CLG. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, again, so my role is um, sort of leading the community engagement work in South Wairarapa. So, um, yeah, I just want to put a slide in here around setting the scene. So um, obviously the key thing being around the CLGs where um, to re-establishing community liaison groups. Um, so this is for us, from our point of view, really provides a, a forum for a positive community engagement, as well as obviously working to, um, as part of the requirement of the resource consent for the wastewater treatment plants. Um, so we're running a joint CLG uh, for the Martinborough and Greytown wastewater treatment plant. Um, you'll see on the terms of reference on the on the consent that it is very much focused around the operations of the plant. Um, but I guess the key message from my perspective and the community engagement is this: this is a really good opportunity um, with uh, obviously local council with South Wairarapa District Council. We've got regional council in the room, uh, Greater Wellington, um, as well as community uh, representatives as well. So we've got a really good opportunity to 
actually capture a lot of feedback that comes through, um, uh, even if it is through a different forum or, in, or another way, with, uh, sort of another forum we can look into uh, at another time. It's it's definitely a good opportunity for us to to capture that feedback and have have really good engagement and, and a flow of information between everyone. Uh, so uh, the other key thing about the CLGs is that um, people, although it is in buy only initially, uh, and the consent gives you a bit of a starting point uh, for us to get these meetings up and running again, uh, we are definitely, um, you know, encourage people to uh, register to become CLG members as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the other final message there in terms of regularity is that these are run on a quarterly basis generally, but uh, that just depends, we, you know, unless otherwise agreed by the CLG members. So if you get the majority of CLG members prefer to run these, for example, half yearly, um, that can be you know, arranged as well. So that's me, Andrew. Yeah, question, a hand up there from, um, sorry, is it? Um, yeah, Gilles, 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 can you hear Gilles. me? Yeah, look, I've got, I've got a question around the composition of the CLG for Martinborough and Gratia. Why did you not include Featherstone? Cool. Would you... Uh, do you know what Tonya over there? Um, kia ora, Gillies. Um, so these two plants currently have a resource consent um, and we the community reference groups or the CLGs are around um, are one of the conditions of that consent and they enable us to connect with the community around how the how the treatment plants are performing and, and how they are impacting the community. Featherston is in a different situation in that the um, consent ex has expired and we've sought an extension. We have an extension of that and it, we are going through the resource consenting process for Featherston. So during this year, now that we've had a bit of a reset with council about what we're going to do in that space, we'll be engaging with the community separately around what are, what are the things that will make up the resource consent for that plant. So that's in quite a different it's in quite a different space. But it doesn't mean we won't engage with the community. We'll engage with it separately or on, on a different from a different angle. Um, also, a, it's a really good question, and it's probably it sounds like it's going to get touched on later and various other parts of the agenda as well yeah it's topical and we're, ha we're happy to chat about it but we won't, don't want to disrupt this meeting for you and can, so, um, yeah. can you um i guess listen through the meeting and see if um see if that makes more sense towards the end and if and if it still doesn't re-ask again at the end or get some more clarification on then perhaps what might the format be for featherston if not this so sort of listen, listen and track it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just come in now with um, very briefly a just a minute or so on the, a reminder to everyone of perhaps the the way we're going to try and operate the CLG, um, and also simple ground rules for managing this pretty big group to try and both to keep it constructive, but also hopefully satisfactory for, it, for all of you with your, um, with your time. So first of all, just a reminder about the terms of reference, um, which I know Rory and the team have, have attached and reference to with a lot of the documents that have come out. So that is very much the, the frame under which the CLG operates. And I, I guess a reminder to, for everyone to remember that there are um, all sorts of other avenues that are also still open and this CLG is in addition to it, So, but it still has its very specific purpose. And I think the purpose and spirit here is very much engagement to enhance communication, help clarify and where possible remove assumptions around what is or what is not happening, and to that extent build understanding for the community. It's not going to necessarily be a... a um, a meeting group that's able to necessarily fix everything, but it certainly can go a long way towards clarifying, removing assumptions and building understanding and hope have, hopefully have a, a better informed dialogue from there on. Some ground rules, just 
very basic ones, show respect for each other, please no personal criticisms. Um, everyone be prepared and try and keep to time to the agenda, because there's um, a lot of information to get through. Um, no interruptions of allocated speakers. Uh, if you have a question, um, follow uh, Gilly's lead with raising a hand or um, address a question through me, or please hold questions, jot them down and hold them. There is gonna be a um, Q and A se session at the end, but we will try and address questions. And if there are a bunch that aren't um, covered, then we'll take that on board and look to what, how can Rory and the team um, liaise afterwards to, to help um, give extra clarification where it's asked for. Um, so that'll be using a parking lot. Take opportunities to ask clarifying questions first. That's the, the first thing. So can, can we make sure that that's the, the original focus of questions as opposed to um, going down other tangents? Value the strengths of diverse input. We've got a really big group here with all sorts of um, strengths. Let's value that and try and bring it into the room. Reminder, participation is by invitation only. Um, if for future meetings, people feel that that invitation list should be extended, um, Rory's already signaled that he's the team is definitely open to that and we'll look at what might be a more appropriate way to, to manage a bigger group, if not this. Um, sharing of content, um, I guess for everyone to be aware, this is, is being recorded as we heard at the beginning. It will be on the SWDC YouTube channel um, for people to access and replay. And finally, just where possible, please stay constructive and solution focused and stick to the spirit of, of engagement in which this is intended. So I'd now like to um, move back to um, Amy Smith to give an introduction of the wastewater treatment plant operations. I think Richard's just going to present this slide and then I'll speak. Yeah, sorry, Andrew. I think Richard's um, got the connection with Richard now. So we've just got the RMA slide. I think you're going to cover Richard. Okay, uh, I believe Richard's having a few problems logging in. Um, Amy or, or Tonya, yeah, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to speak to yeah, this just slide a brief just idea. briefly. Yeah, so I'm Amy Smith, Senior Process Engineer at Wellington Water. Um, so just, I guess this is just sort of setting the scene around all the different um, standards, policy statements and plans that sort of back up these resource consents. We've got the RMA, we've got central government which sets standards and then regional council greater wellington regional council which sets policy statements and then we end up with these resource consents which we're then managing um, these treatment plants under so if you could move to the next slide now rory that would be great i'm here just really to give you a overview on wastewater treatment uh, 101 so um, i wanted to discuss uh, you know, how treatment plants should work and set the scene so that we can all understand what level of treatment we can expect from the Martinborough and Greytown wastewater treatment plants. So this slide here is a generic treatment plant description. We have the network where, you know, homes and in industries, cafes all produce wastewater, it goes into the network. Typically we would have an inlet screening process where we remove all of the inorganic material. Then we have the sort of bulk of the treatment, which is primary, secondary treatment and sedimentation, uh, which is, you know, that's where we really treat the wastewater and remove the organic wastewater contaminants. And um, if you could just click again, Rory. Just one more click, please. Yeah, but in at, um, Greytown and Martinborough, these main liquid stream treatment processes are all combined into the pond treatment that you've got there. Um, and then moving on after, no, sorry, not, not moving. <laughs> Can you go back one click, please? Sure. 
Um, and then after you've got the liquid stream treatment, you've got disinfection, which is where, um, another stage, and then we can discharge to water or land. And so now I'm gonna just talk a bit more about these individual treatment processes on the next slides. So in an oxidation pond, um, we have the raw wastewater coming in. We've got sort of two main layers. We've got the top aerobic treatment layer, which is where algae live, and they use the sunlight to produce oxygen. That oxygen is then used by the microorganisms in that top layer to, um, they use oxygen and they eat up the wastewater contaminants. As the wastewater travels through the pond, lots of solids settle out into the bottom anaerobic sludge layer and uh, so the sludge layer accumulates over time. Some of that sludge does get digested, but if you could click one more time, please, Rory. Um, over time, that sludge layer builds up to a point where you've got a lot less um, effective treatment layer at the top. So that's very quickly what a pond, how a pond works. It's a very cool um, treatment process, works quite well in small communities that have space to fit them. Then UV treatment is a process where, which we use ultraviolet light to basically uh, zap the path pathogens, the treated effluent out of the pond passes through a, a set of light bulbs basically, and they um, remove the pathogens, which are the things that make us, um, would make us sick if we were to be exposed to them. You could move to the next slide. And then ultimately at the end of a treatment plant, we have the discharge. So. Uh, we can discharge to water, and that could be in South Wairarapa, that's a stream or a river, or we could discharge to land. So a discharge to, uh, to water is really the typical way we've always discharged treated wastewater in New Zealand. The resource consent states the volume that we're allowed to discharge, the quality, and the discharge dilution rate into that body of water. The quality of that treated effluent is monitored and also the effects in the river are monitored by um, ecological sampling in the river itself. And as we progress through the, these resource consent terms in South, South Wairarapa, we are moving away from discharge to water towards discharge to land. So the discharge to land activity provides additional treatment for nutrients in the wastewater and it has a um, a cultural value as well. So disposal is really managed by the field capacity of the specific site. And again, the quality and effects of these this activity is also monitored. So we monitor the groundwater and we monitor the soil quality to assess how the um, disposal activity is having an effect on the environment or not. And uh, just, uh, you know, discharge to land is where we're all heading, but it is very much affected by the weather and seasonal. So. That's a brief overview of wastewater treatment and I think I'll pass on to Martin now, thank you. Thanks Amy. Um, evening everyone again, um, Martin Grombeck, I'm the treatment team leader in South Wairapa. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got a, a team of uh, four treatment operators dedicated to uh, eight treatment plants across the district between water and wastewater. Um, I'm here to talk about the Greytown and uh, Martinborough wastewater treatment plants and what we do on a daily basis. Um, you just move this slide along, please, Riley. Um, so uh, the Martinborough and Greytown plants are essentially more or less the same. You have uh, oxidation ponds and then UV treatment and then discharge to, to land or river. On a daily basis, we are visually checking the sites, seeing the condition of the oxidation ponds. Do they look right? Do they smell right? Are the aerators which pump additional oxygen into the, into the liquid um, operating as they should? Uh, um, clearing any blockages um, and just generally keeping the plants ticking over and working as they should. Just move on to the next slide, please. Um, and yeah, so there's just essentially the processes are the same. Um, there's just minor differences between the sites. Um, just move on again, please. Cheers. Um, <clears throat> so, in regards of what we've been up to as of late. Um, so there's been quite a bit of activity on the wastewater treatment plant side. Um, we've just completed some sl uh, pond sludge level surveys, um, which would uh, utilize drones to map out the, the, the layer of the, the anaerobic sludge layer, the solids on the bottom of the pond, um, which provide us with a, a 
a lot of useful data that we could accurately map out how much sludge we're actually dealing with and, and how much liquid volume we have, which is where the, the, the majority of the treatment occurs. And we can use that information to then um, progress and inform the uh, desludging work stream, which is um, yet to occur. Um, we've also had a number of health and safety improvements. Um, tie ladders um, into the ponds, which are quite uh, quite treacherous uh, to get in and out of, particularly if they're lined, uh, very slippery. And um, that also means that when try, if you fell in and you try to get out, you've, you're going to have a really hard time, But that, which has been addressed with those ladders. Um, we have life jackets issued to um, all the site operators. Uh, we've replaced steel grates, um, which are really quite heavy and awkward to, to move around. We've replaced those with fiberglass ones. It's so much easier to handle. Um, harness points at all sampling locations. So the treatment operators have something physical to latch onto and an extraction point. Uh, we've also purchased a, a Porticom office, uh, which serves as a base of operations for the wastewater treatment plant operators. Um, and a lot of work on the improving the reliability of the irrigation equipment. Um, so both irrigators uh, was it's subject to various uh, faults for a variety of reasons, both mechanical control um, problems. Uh, it took considerable effort from several teams to really methodically work through those problems. And the end result was um, quite a remarkable improvement in performance and reliability. Um, so for uh, an example, at one stage, we had an operator spending the majority of their working week uh, nursing one site just to keep it operational when going. Um, compare that to where we are now, where that, that piece of equipment operates pretty much flawlessly at the touch of a button. So a huge improvement there. Um, management plans, uh, it's a sort of work in progress. That's uh, fi finalizing the land management plans for both sites. Essentially the steps we take to ensure that the land that receives the wastewater discharged is uh, managed in a sustainable manner. Um, bird control, um, it was quite a big issue at Greytown. Uh, we had a, a, between 300 and 400 individual swans or paradise shell ducks on that site, which added the equivalent to about 300 people, well, 300 people's wastewater to that site, which um, about a 10 to 15 percent population increase just because of those birds. So we uh, tried a laser unit, um, which we then purchased, uh, which essentially scares the birds away from site without harming them and um, keeps the, um, the site an undesirable location for those birds. Um, and flow control. So we've had uh, multiple manual isolation valves installed at both sites, both Greytown and Martinborough, um, which now gives us the ability to, to isolate um, individual ponds uh, where we previously had non, uh, no control. Uh, and we've also installed an automated valve at Martinborough, which uh, controls the, the, the level and the maturation cells, um, sort of polishing ponds at the, um, the end of the, the oxidation pond process um, to a set level. So that's programmable. Um, we can set it and it just maintains that level and opens and shuts. Um, and this replaced a, um, a float valve, um, which was prone to failure and was extremely high risk to try and service. So it's a, really big um, improvement for operability. We'll just go to the next slide, please. Uh, so some operational constraints. Um, neither site have inlet screens, um, which is in a typical, typical wastewater treatment plant, you will have a, a, a screen which removes all the inorganics and solids uh, from the incoming effluent before it moves down into the rest of the plant. Um, we don't have those. Um, so that means that we are, anything that gets flushed down the, um, the, into the, the sewer, uh, wet wipes, sanitary products, toilet ducks, small toys, balls, you name it, whatever gets into the, into this, um, the network ends up in, in the ponds. And we can only remove a fraction of what comes in via um, outlet screens, which are at the, the, the outlet of the oxidation ponds. So not particularly effective. Um, uh, inorganic buildup in, um, of the sludge layer, which is reducing the, um, the aerobic zone. So uh, the, the volume of the pond is being taken up more and more by the anaerobic layer, the sludge layer. 
um, which re reduces the resilience of the ponds, um, it impacts due to dry and hot weather. So uh, during extremely dry hot weather um, evaporation um, takes effect and we're losing consistently uh, the, the, the aerobic liquid layer on the top of the ponds. And um, high loading events, say market days, you know, Toast Martin Borough, for example, um, those result in a um, sort of a, a shock load to the treatment plants, which require um, a bit of special um, navigation and mediation. Um, which basically, it's uh, the, the ecology in the ponds. They tend to, or any wastewater treatment plant process, really, they, they prefer a steady feed of nutrients um, during events like these. Uh, all of a sudden they're subjected to a, a far higher, more intense um, amount of nutrients, which uh, does tend to have an impact. Um, I've definitely noticed increased maintenance, uh, predominantly due to wet wipes. Um, these um, which shouldn't be flushed, I'll point out, uh, cause blockages of the mechanical aerators um, and wastewater pump stations, and they then reform into islands or, or ropes, essentially, and that attracts further solids and ragging, which then we have to remove from the ponds. Um, and all these things sort of, uh, again, sort of uh, contribute to a high risk of undesirable um, conditions as in you know, anaerobic conditions, and that's where you'll get um, you know, odor issues in the, um, in, the, in the oxidation ponds. Um, the UV treatment is, is largely, its effectiveness is largely dictated by the performance of the ponds. Uh, the UV um, requires um, a certain clarity of the water to actually penetrate and um, expose, uh, sorry, um, target and kill the, um, or sorry, disinfect the um, pathogens. Um, the more solid particles that are in the water, the more shielding occurs where the, uh, the, um, the pathogens are able to essentially hide in pockets where they're not exposed to UV light. So the, the, the higher the clarity of the water, uh, the better the performance. Um, we're also facing um, global supply chain issues. Uh, and, um, shouldn't be too much of a surprise. We're still um, subject to COVID-related impacts, um, which cause you know, quite significant shipping delays, uh, particularly for UV components as they come all from overseas. Um, you know, power supply issues. Um, as, it, as you've probably all been subject to yourself, um, anything that occurs to the power grid um, affects us as well, which uh, essentially just turns the plants off. Um, river levels, uh, when they're low, they either restrict or prohibit discharge in, entirely, which only leaves land discharge. Um, and, and then if there are issues with the irrigators, that leaves us with no method of discharge. So we're relying on storage and building the levels up in the pond. Uh, we also have um, uh, conflicting land use um, with some of the discharge fields where there's multiple users then that takes quite a bit of navigating to um, to um, utilize the land for our intent which is to dispose of the effluent. Let's move on to the next slide. Oh, I think now I'll pass it over to uh, Adam unless there's any questions. I've got a question there from Mel Maynard. Evening, Mel. Oh, kia ora koutou, kato. Thanks very much for um, all of that, Martin. That's great. Um, Martin, you had up there about the um, inflow screens, and then there was about four things after that. So uh, are they, would the screens actually prevent all of that sludge, wet wipes and all of the additional things coming through um, before, so, because is the sludge, are we saying the sludge is the issue? Too much sludge, not enough water for aeration? Um, it, 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 essentially, it's, it's part of the puzzle. Um, inlet screens will capture any inorganics. Um, inorganics are the, you know, the, the stuff that just um, will not ever break down. Yeah. Um, and it has absolutely no value or use in the ponds. So um, without inlet screens, that stuff's adding or taking up volume in the ponds, which could otherwise um, be used by, or taken up by um, the, the liquid layer or the sludge layer. You're always going to have a sludge layer because that's what the um, yeah. 
your your wastewater solids break down to. Um, but it certainly would um, improve things in terms of um, getting all the stuff that we don't want in the ponds and keeping it out. Thanks for that, Martin. Yeah. Thank you, Mel. Martin, I've got a follow-up question to that as well, sort of on the back of Mel's. That <clears throat> strikes me that um, there were some quite high-profile public campaigns for Auckland in particular around the wet wipes, was it, at the start of mm. COVID and they had some major issues. Yeah. How, um, how well understood is that within all of us in the community of how big an impact simple things like wet wipes are having on your ability to do your job and and maybe what role could the CLG play in in promoting that really and powerful simple message yeah definitely um and in, in terms of impacts to um to wastewater in general it's a horrendous issue and it's far-reaching um I said it's not just what we get at the plant, which is at the the, um, the end of the process. It's also throughout the network. So uh, network blockages, um, overflows, um, and um, the impacts to wastewater um, pump stations, um, as well as what we get at the plants. Um, all throughout, the impacts are felt throughout the network. So it's not just us at the, tre um, at the treatment end, it's also the network operators as well, um, as well as residents themselves. Um, that are having to deal with overflows. Um, you know, wet wipes are just the, are the bane of our existence in some regards. Um, there's, there's been some work done about um, accurately labeling them. Although some of them make, make claims that they can be flushed, not the case. Yes, they, physically they can go down the toilet, but so can a number of other things that you wouldn't want to put down there. Um, they just should never ever go near wastewater. Do, do not flush them. Um, as far as community engagement goes, um, yeah, uh, but it's the, repeat the message. If it's not the three Ps, they shouldn't go down the toilet. All right, any other questions? <clears throat> Sorry, Martin, I just, um, I did just have through you, um, Mr. Chair, I just, um, did have one more question about it around the um, alerts that automated um, controls and flow control that's been put in, in Martinborough and um, with that in place, with how regularly are you still going in there? Despite, I realise there's an automated system, but we've had overflow events within this triennium that were caused by automated alarms that didn't um, go off. Yeah. So could you just narrow, narrow down the, the question for me? Oh, so 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 how how regularly are you going into and in, in checking to assess that the um, flow control buttons that are um, automated that have been put put into Martinborough, so that if they aren't working, there's a physical person there that would pick up that those things aren't working and right. aren't delivering. Yep. Gotcha, gotcha. Right, um, we're on site every day, sometimes multiple times a day, visually checking. Um, and the automatic control is um, um, is operating, doing its thing. Uh, we can see that remotely what it's doing, what its position is, as well as what the level in the pond is as well. And we've also got some backup um, alarms too, so we're not solely reliant on one thing. Um, we'll get multiple alarms at, at different stages, uh, depending on what the pond level is. And that's downstream of the valve. So if the valve fails, we'll still get notified that the pond level is increasing and we'll still get further alarms at, at increasing frequency at above that point. So there's multiple layers of protection on top of the visual checks and the um, and the, the valve itself. Thank you. That's good clarification. Um, well, thank you very much, Martin. Sorry. Thank, thank you. you, Mel. Thanks for moving to Adam. Adam next. Adam Matson to give an overview of the upcoming project work. Yeah, kia ora everybody again. Uh, so Adam Matson, the, the program delivery lead, uh, South Wairarapa. Uh, so just got a couple of slides here leading into, so um, if we jump to the next one, thanks Rory. So, you know, Martin um, or Amy, Amy's done a, um, a bit of a wastewater 101, uh, which is really good to help try and sort of set the scene around um, treatment plant processes and then 
Martin's touched on some of the day-to-day -day operational elements, uh, running the treatment plants, some of the work that was um, been, you know, some of the, the renewal and upgrade work that's been happening, um, as well as still some of the continued ongoing uh, operational uh, uh, challenges and constraints. So that also then leads into sort of um, what what does the sort of the, the long term uh, upgrade program also look like? So <clears throat> you know uh, these last two years have been around some of those items that that Martin's already. Um, touched on and you know that helps to sort of set the scene for us over the last couple of years around developing our 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 our, our program going forward and, and a bit of a prioritized um, program on that so and also what helps us um, in thinking about that upgrade program going forward is uh, obviously the consents that we do have for the two wastewater treatment plants and helps to sort of outline those minimum requirements especially touching on that that um, pathway to compliance. So uh, if we could jump to the next slide, thank you. So um, <clears throat> just as a sort of a, a high level, I thought I'd touch on, you know, each of the two, the two treatment plants do have uh, their resource consents, uh, as I understand, granted in 2016. And they outline sort of high level, these different stages of where we're wanting to move uh, through over the next uh, wee while um, through these stages. And all around, at the the outcome we're looking to achieve is about this 100% uh, um, um, land treatment, uh, as well as under that storage uh, stage two B um, additional storage, uh, which helps for um, you know storing over the winter period and, and and irrigating over the the summer period. So you know we've we've moved into the stage one B for for at both treatment plants and. That means we were operating um, some irrigation to to land. Um, the last you know package of years have had been around um, optimizing current um, current performance and current operations. And obviously, as Martin touched on, there's still ongoing uh, constraints we'd like to continue to work through, and we will still work through as we're still looking at moving to to irrigate to land. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, don't need to go through that in, in too much detail. The next slide there. So I, I, I put in a couple of photos here just to help sort of frame that context as well. And these are sort of um, as linked back to these, these future irrigation areas for, for the two different sites there. So on the left for Martinborough Wastewater Treatment Plant, down the bottom left-hand corner is the, the, the current uh, couple of ponds as well as the uh, existing area in blue showing that the, the existing um, irrigation area and then uh, through the, the resource consent um, we've got a, a larger area out, outlined in, in Payne Farm uh, which is uh, potentially setting us up for, for future land irrigation. Um, there's a lot of work that will need to be done to, to bring that um, in line. Um, and then equally on the on the right hand side for, for Greytown, down the down the bottom right hand corner, there's an image there showing the existing irrigation field, uh, uh, as well as the, the main image there with the different sites, A's, B's, C's. Uh, there's, there's a bit of work that needs to be done in terms of identifying a, a consolidated piece of land that would be suitable for uh, future land irrigation. So we're, we're working with, with South Wadarapa in particular, the um, property advisory team around um, consolidating a, 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 a usable piece of land um, over the coming years to, to, to accommodate that future land irrigation. So just to, just to sort of help try and frame the context with some, some aerial maps there. And then, yeah, thanks Rory. Lastly, um, I just wanted to touch on sort of what are some of the, the timelines look like and at the top here, I just wanted to, to sort of give a, a typical how we might sort of plan out our, our delivery and that and the delivery um, end of the organization is where I sit so we tend to sort of break it down into roughly sort of a, a three year delivery program where we sort of we plan a year two we, we prepare we go through what we need to do and do risking activities and communications planning before we actually move into actually delivering things on the ground these uh waste sort of treatment plant compliance projects will be a little bit different you know it's not like we're, we're we're building a a new pipeline or upgrading a new pipeline so 
you know, there will be elements of sort of flicking between, you know, preparing another package of works before we then deliver that. Um, so as, as they stand, uh, we're moving into the LTP year two this year and, and uh, we'll be going through these, um, these planning phases. It's about understanding, uh, preparing, scoping what we need to do in terms of trying to achieve those long-term uh, consent um, goals um, with moving towards, progressively moving towards 100% um, land, land um, irrigation. Um, I think that's, yeah, that was the end of my slides there. So uh, I'm not sure if there's any initial questions uh, at this stage. Uh, otherwise, um, I think we've got an opportunity at the end as well, if anything comes to mind. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. Adam, it's really interesting. Um, and also, I guess one question I'd have, like that interesting slide for you know future projects. Where might people access that other than on this video? Yeah, future the future projects. So I mean, on Wellington Waters website, we do and we will have um, like a, a projects. We've got a projects page, and on there we will be putting these these projects on there and. You know, we hope to um, have a bit of bit more detail around uh, where we're up to with these the, the delivery of these projects, you know, timelines um, uh, on on those project pages on on the website. So that's that's a really useful place for for even the general public um, if they're interested to to go and have a look at the latest on there. Um, but you know, in, in this forum as well, um, I think the idea is that. We'll, we'll be repeatedly uh, coming back and, and just giving the latest update. How 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 are we getting on? What is the what is the latest in terms of achieved? Like these are long term uh, program of work, but um, it's always useful to come back to the the CLG to to give a bit of an update on where where things are at. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. That's probably a really good time, I think, to move to Aaron Johnston and Ben Bond to give us a a picture of the. Greater Wellington Regional Council's role in the consenting process in relation to um, wastewater. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, kia ora koutou. My name's Aaron Johnston. I'm a, um, a resource advisor with the Wellington Greater Wellington Regional Council. Um, one of the jobs that I do is I'm the compliance officer for the Greater Wellington Regional Council, uh, managing or overseeing the consent. Um, WAR 080254, which is Greytown, and WAR 120258. So I'll just let Ben introduce himself briefly. Yeah, good evening, everybody. My name's Ben Bond. I am a environmental enforcement officer, but I'm also the lead um, for the um, waste, wastewater treatment plant compliance forum at GWRC. So I kind of work with all of the compliance officers for all of the plants across the entire region, um, working out compliance issues and hopefully coming to solutions. But Aaron's going to just talk you through um, GWRC's role in these two particular plants. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, <clears throat> so just really big picture stuff. Um, basically, the Greater Wellington Regional Council was mandated under the Local Government Act 2002 to promote sustainable development. So um, that being social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being of the communities that we um, have in our region. Um, further to that, the Resource Management Act um, 1991, that's really the key piece of legislation for um, my role. And um, this basically sets out how we um, oversee the resource consents that we hold is one of the key functions of the regional council. So, um, you know, we really are looking at controlling just um, contaminants within the environment and making sure that they're appropriately discharged in the right places, um, managing the effects of them as best as they can be. So um, the two consents, Greytown and Martinborough Wastewater Treatment Plant, they were each granted um, to South Wire Upper District Council through um, fully publicly notified consent hearing processes. So basically what that means is that um, there's an application that comes in from South Wilded Upper District Council, then that's looked at by a processing officer who um, 
writes a report, looks at all the evidence from the um, the applicant, but also independent experts, people who um, are brought in either by South Wairarapa District Council or um, by the regional council. So then uh, at the end of that, they take their report to the hearing and there's a hearing chair, it's essentially an independent person who weighs up that evidence. Um, they have, um, you know, live evidence from those experts as well as submissions from the public or other interested parties. Um, and see a number of people at the meeting today that obviously have submitted um, and then um, submitters from the public as well. Um, and basically all of that um, is weighed up and then the final consent is granted with a set of conditions, a set of restrictions that the um, consent has to abide by and the operations need to abide by. So if you can just jump to the next slide. So on an ongoing basis, sorry, terrible time, I've got a train <laughs> coming next to me. Um, on an ongoing basis, we are um, responsible for monitoring the compliance by, um, of the consent and taking enforcement action essentially where that's, um, where that's not met. So um, that's gonna go on for the duration of the consent. Um, obviously now, Wellington Water is the consent holder and um, South Wilded Upper is the asset owner. So we primarily deal with Wellington Water. Um, basically what Greater Wellington Regional Council does um, is primarily mandated by statutory requirements and the conditions of the resource consent, but we also offer some other services, for instance, the um, flow monitoring data uh, for the Rua Mahanga River and the Papuai Stream, are both monitored by our environmental science team. And we, um, we essentially give that data to Wellington Water who then know when they're allowed to discharge and, and under what conditions. Um, we work with the consent holder, so I um, work with a number of people from Wellington Water and um, I look at the management plans and have those checked by experts as necessary and then we certify them once they're ready. Um, and compliance assessments, so that's, um, we get annual reporting from uh, Wellington Water and then there are also quarterly reports that are required by the consent and then anything ad hoc, for instance, um, the February storm that we had at the beginning of the year. Um, obviously there was, you know, a lot of issues around the plants at that time and so, um, you know, that would be an example of an ad hoc um, compliance assessment. And then finally enforcement action where appropriate. Um, yeah, that's, that's essentially um, there hasn't been any enforcement action so far. Happy to take questions. We've got Mel there, have we? Mel, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chair. I just, um, I was wondering, Aaron, just if you could tell us when those the resource consents were granted originally. Uh, off the top of my head, I believe they were around 2012, uh, 2016 actually. I mean, about 2016, yeah. And we're still operating under those same ones. From Correct, yeah, they have 35 year consents. Okay. Thank you, Aaron and Ben. That's a really um, interesting summary of where the, where the Regional Council fits into this. Um, I guess there might be other questions towards the end which people can um, have an opportunity in about 15, 20 minutes time. Um, might move now to Stefan Corbett to give a, a wider context for the South Wairapa District Council um, with their role in this process kind of to complete the picture. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Namahi Nui Kia Koto Chair. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Good morning. <laughs> good evening. Um, I'm Stephen Corbin. I'm the uh, Group Manager Partnerships and Operations here in South Wairarapa District Council. 
Um, thanks everyone for attending and using your evening to um, participate in this meeting. It's good to see you. Um, look, I, you know, don't, I'll keep this short because I'm sure we want to have as much time as possible for questions. But um, first of all, to thank uh, Wellington Water Limited for the work that they do for us. Um, you know, it's a tough job that they've got. Uh, we don't give them um, as much money as they uh, want or need. Uh, we've got very limited budgets um, because of our size. Uh, the um, infrastructure isn't um, everything it could be. Some of it's quite old and it needs improvement. Um, and there are some headwinds that they face in operating the plants uh, that you've heard um, in relation to most recently COVID and the global um, supply chain disruptions that they've got. But, you know, um, nevertheless, all of those things notwithstanding, um, Wellington Water Limited does a great job for us and we're very grateful for the, for the work that they do. That often includes responding to um, emergencies that uh, threaten the plant's operation and put us all in jeopardy and they're um, there always uh, um, protecting us, our health and, um, and our safety. So, um, you know, uh, just first of all, a thank you to Wellington Water Limited. The council um, is committed to making improvements where we can uh, over the four plants that we've got. Um, we are working with a very limited budget. At our um, rate base, as you know, is you know varies, but it's between eight and nine thousand rate payers. It's not a lot of people producing revenue, um, and uh, therefore, you know, one percent of rates. Um, it was about $180,000, you know, um, you spend $180,000 of new money and that your rates go up by about 1%. So it's, you know, we don't have a lot of money. So we have to be very ruthless in terms of what we prioritise and how we spend that public money. And our priority has, has been over the past couple of years, making sure that we get our drinking plants right that has had to be the thing that we focused on uh, the most. And we've spent, you know, about $7 million over the past three years on making sure you get those, we get those drinking plant, um, plants operating properly. And we've, and we've, we've done that. They're, they're compliant uh, largely and, and we're satisfied with the work that, um, the investment that um, we've made there uh, cap in capital on the plants. Um, we are working with Wellington Water Limited on where our limited resource should be um, directed on these wastewater plants. Uh, and we acknowledge that, I mean, it's common knowledge that major investment is needed to, to bring these plants up to a modern standard. Uh, but you're really talking about a lot of money to do that. Desludging a, de a plant might cost you, you know, a million and a half, um, uh, we, we are really talking about a lot of money. You, you um, need to have a work program that manages uh, the risks attached to these plants over a period of time. And we are doing that um, in association with Wellington Water Limited and we're keeping the regulator, Greater Wellington, um, close to us as we do that and communicating well with them as we, as we do that. So, um, we're trying to, I guess, position ourselves to reduce the risk um, risks around these plants as much as we can. And of course, in the back of our minds, um, we're trying to position ourselves the best we can for reform because reform is, uh, you know, despite what some people might say around the South Wairarapa, reform is just around the corner. And I don't think there's any avoiding it. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is make sure that we are positioned as well as we can with our assets and the work that we've started on those assets as we move towards that reform point. So look, that's, that's probably, I'll probably leave it there and let people, um, let us get on to uh, question time. Thank you.
Thank you, Stefan. <clears throat> um, I guess, yeah, on hot on the back of your um, presentation, any any questions or of clarification for Stefan to begin with? And I guess I'd invite um, more more broadly then any um, questions that people have um, been forming for any of the speakers so far that they would like to take this opportunity to ask and and <clears throat> um, get a little bit more detail or clarify an area of possible um, confusion. Okay, great. Um, Gillies. Yeah, kia ora everybody. Sorry, I should have introduced myself uh, before. Um, I'm a trustee at Papua Marae, so I have uh, some keen interest in what's happening down our road. So one of the questions I have at the moment is, when you're looking at the um, storing of the wastewater onto land, those sites that you've identified, one of them in particular look pretty close to, to the marae. What's the proximity to dwellings and habitation um, limitations do you have to, to dwellings and that kind of thing? I can answer that question for you. Um, so at the, at the moment, we are we have that block of land that Adam showed on his slides. And that is simply just a block of land at the moment that's available. Um, so there's starting um, in the next couple of years, there will be a design, um, a, a detailed design program of work for the stage two irrigation area. And like yeah we need to take into account all of those things like proximity to people to you guys at, at the marae um we need to take into account the proximity to the the river um it's also a flood flood prone to flooding um we need to take into account the soil quality it varies across the, the site um and we need to design the the irrigation equipment to be suitable for each of those sort of different areas so yeah it's a complex piece of work mm. that we we need to work through and we need to start on that so that we're ready for the um consent condition of um 2030 to be running that block by 2030 i mean ideally we'd maybe like to yeah bring it forward but we'll see and well, that's, yeah. your leaf. that's your leaf i thought you'd actually made the decision already so no no, no that's just a that's the land that South Wairarapa owns or manages whatever leases, whatever the status of it is, yep. Okay, and is there a point at which the, the ground becomes saturated? Yeah. And, so, and if there is, then what happens next? Yeah, so that's, um, we run this site as a, um, an, like as a deficit irrigation facility, um, the exist, the current site, so that um, picture at the, the bottom right with that um, the arc, the pivot irrigation system. So we have groundwater um, moisture probes in the ground that tell us the um, the soil moisture. And then we, Martin and I actually um, sort of make a decision whether we're gonna run the irrigation or not that week. And um, it's sort of dependent on the gliding club um, and obviously the soil moisture condition and the if, if there's actually capacity in the land to take the water. Um, and as we move into the second stage, we'll have more land to apply the wastewater to. So we'd expect to take more out of the stream, be, be discharging less to the stream and more to land. And then ultimately stage 2B is where we store it over winter in a winter storage pond. So you've identified about 100 hectares for storage. Is it for, for the Greytown piece? Can you flick back to the other slide, which oh, I can actually I put it on my screen, sorry. Um, at Greytown, yeah, the second area is approximately 85 hectares, but again, that's the thing, whether it's, you know, how much of it is actually fully usable or 
not with when you've got your boundaries and yeah. So it's all that all that information is actually um, defined in the resource consent application as well. Okay, thank you. Sounds like um, from listening to you, Amy, that you'll be having fairly close conversations with um, Gillies and the, all the yeah. local community and certainly the community at the Marae. Yeah, the yeah. yeah, the design team will, yeah. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but I guess we might just park that. I imagine that's extremely complex if we go too much deeper into that yeah. quite enormous project. Mm. Um, we'll just park that for now. Um, I see questions come up. I, it looked like an order of apologies I get, if I get your names wrong. Um, Narita Was, is it? And then Mel to go in that order. So Nar Narada. Uh, Narita. Kia ora tata. Narita. Um, so I'm Narita Hooper and I chair the Māori Standing Committee for South Rapa District Council. Um, but I'll, my question was for Aaron Johnson of Greater Wellington and resource consent applications and then um, you talked about monitoring and in particular one of your consent applications would be monitoring uh, river flow for rural mahanga is that correct? correct is that the only thing you monitor for when you do no, uh, the greater wellington regional council the environmental science team have um have sensors and rivers they do uh, rainfall wind speed basically kind of every environmental condition that you could um, mm -hmm. think of. And they have those sensors all across the Wellington region, by the Dapa. Um, so uh, the way that the consent works is that there's uh, one specific flow monitoring site, which is near the wastewater treatment plant. And that's basically the best information that we have that we can give to Wellington Water, who then um, have a live record exactly what the what the river's doing and when they can discharge to it. Well, I was, I was more um, asking about the health of the river. So what is there in place for monitoring around fish species, um, habitat and things like that? Is it, it, that? I mean, to me, that's cultural monitoring. Does yeah. uh, Greater Wellington do any of that part as well? If I yeah. may, Narita, yeah. Hi, I'm Ben. Um, yeah, there's a whole team of ecologists um with obviously a limited number of personnel and budget but they do obviously study the ecology of the region in its rivers and on its land and its forests you could probably find out more about that on our website if i'm totally honest um but they yes they do monitor fish species um i think it's something also that um fish and game do as well and what what do you do with that data like, for instance, for, say, one of the marae who um, regularly put a hinaki in one of the streams and collect kai, and that's part of their mahinga kai, it's part of their manakitanga for their marae, um, what do you do with your data that tells you, oh, you know, things are changing, something's happened, there's been an event? Um, I can't speak to um, exactly how our science team operate because neither Aaron nor I work precisely in that department but obviously um, broadly speaking the science teams whether it's hydrologists or ecologists um, are looking for long-term trends and that basically informs our regional plans and it, it lets us know um, in terms of rules what can and cannot happen in a particular area over time. Mm. Okay, oh, sounds like there's more work to be done there. Kia ora. I could, can I provide just a little bit more information to Narita? So we do do the monitoring as part of our resource consent. So we, in, in the river, and we monitor the upstream, downstream and effluent quality um, on a monthly basis as per the resource consent. And then we also do like, we assess the quality of the ecology in the river as well um, by specialists. So there is the, the annual report data, that's all wrapped up in the annual report data as well. Yeah, sorry, Narita, if you were asking specifically about the plants, the onus is on Wellington Water and South Wai Rapid District Council to carry out that ecological testing for the water quality. It's, we hold them to 
those consent conditions which tell them they have to go and do particular types of testing at particular times. Yeah, that's great. It's it's the data though. Where does the data go? Like for us that live in White South Wairarapa, that swim in that river and things like that, how do we know our water's okay? Now, okay um, for swimming in, for instance. But I presume that, you know, um, Amy's group are doing some of it, Greater Wellington are doing other bits of it, and you're only going to do what is it, whatever's in the parameters of the um, consent as well. Um, just, yeah, it's, my, it's my understanding that the TAs do let people know if there is some sort of issue with the um, water. I know it's certainly up in Masters and where I'm based, that does happen. Um, and mm. You can go on the website, on the GW website, and find out where it's safe to swim, for example. Yeah, you mean sort of like an algae bloom or something like that? Yeah, there's always um, uh, at the end of the effect. Yeah, it's good to know the uh, quality of the health all the time, monitored all the time, and um, rather than at the end of the event. Um, Nadia, there's a lot of information on the um, GW website. They, they monitor for nutrients, um, mainly nitrogen and phosphorus uh, metals, you know, like heavy metals, copper, I think, and zinc. Um, they've got microbiology, so they do, they do look out for E. coli and anything nasty that's going to make people sick. Um, there's some sediment monitors, and, and all of the information's on G-Dub, and it's by river across the region. And that is not, you know, like that's not emergency data. That's just steady collated data that you can use to understand uh, the health of the waterways that are in and around your um, your region. So, you know, th there is a lot of information I can share it with you. Um, I've recently been through it and I was pretty impressed with the level of information that was available. It's not, okay. on, all, it's not on all rivers, but Rua Mahanga is actually one of the rivers that they do a lot a lot on, uh, for example. Yeah. Well, it should be because it's Fai Tua Rua Mahanga, isn't it? But um, no, that's okay. I mean, I'm talking more about cultural monitoring. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it'd be good if you could circulate more information for our Māori Standing Committee, um, Stefan, that'd be great. But I have seen that data on uh, Greater Wellington site as well. I've looked at that. Like Narita, you're looking for more live kind of <clears throat> live runoff data that you can kind of keep up with that's not that you can kind of respond to as it happens rather than kind of notice afterwards in retrospect. I guess so, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Um, the next question was from Was. Is that yeah. So my name's Rachel Miller and I'm a resident at Papawai. Um, I just wondered the inlet screens, why don't we have them? Is that just a financial issue? Like there's just not enough money, as Stefan said, to push in inlet screens? Because they sound like they're fairly important. Martin, are you able to come in there, Martin? I'll probably... Yeah, probably you, not the best step as an answer to that question. <laughs> sure. um, yeah, yep. We'd love to do everything we could to fix the treatment plants. And there's a big, there's a competing demand for a lot of money to be spent. Um, and inlet screens are on our inlet development program for the sites. Um, Um, and just one last question, when are we, uh, like, so when are you going to start talking to the community about the details of how that Papua land is going to be used? Adam, do you want to answer that question yeah, about sure. the program? Um, yeah, I, I, um, kia ora, Adam again, uh, program delivery lead. So, um, in terms of the uh, this year, we'll, we'll be able to to, to initiate the, the programs of work that we're looking to kick off. You know, start. Um, we'll get a, a project team on board, and in terms of looking at the um, the prioritised list of activities that we're going to need to achieve. But but in terms of yeah, the, the, a big there is a big piece of work, a big question mark around 
exactly uh, the what the sort of the future uh, irrigation site or sites uh, may be at, at um, in Greytown there. Um, so it's it's a piece of work that we'll have to work quite closely with the uh, the property team at South Wairarapa District Council. So they have this uh, on their their radar um, to 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 work with with us and helping to to consolidate or uh, work through what needs to be done there um, in terms of identifying that 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 um, that irrigation site. So I I, I guess I um, in short. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, I guess in the in the, in the coming, I, I I understand it's something that the um, the team are wanting to 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 work a uh, South Wairarapa want to work through in the next couple of years, but um, I wouldn't have a time frame at this stage. Um, okay, thanks for that, Rachel. Actually, I had to duck out on my husband Matt. Um, yeah, no, the, the only reason we brought that up is that I think this has been going on for eight years of engagement with us, um, and various things have been said over those eight years with you know high fences, biohazard signs, um, tree planting, um, all these things, you know, if, if we're going to be doing tree planting along there, that should have started by now, otherwise the trees are going to be pointless. So we would just like to understand what's going to, the gliding clubs obviously moved and most of one of the sites. So that, that's another impact about how it's going to, going to go there. So we'd just like to see some involvement again about the land going forward and what its impact to us is going to be um, monitoring of our well water. You know, there's, there's, all, there's a whole raft of things that we're interested in. Um, kia ora, uh, uh, Tonya here again. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that and um, and the requests that have been put up. And um, as this is why these things are, are absolutely invaluable to us as the new um, tangata tiaki over this place is, is to think about you know, we have to balance how much money we can get from the council and the ratepayers, and then what we do with it. Where's our best bang for buck? So your input is invaluable, um, and, and I'm really glad that we've started this conversation. Sorry if we don't have all the answers yet. No, oh no, they <laughs> don't expect the answers tonight. But just just raising. Yeah, no, no, it's cool. It's really good. I actually appreciate you coming along and, and sharing with us. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, look at what would be um, appropriate or useful to put on the future agenda items and that, that might be worth considering to, um, with a bit, bit more detail to have a more robust discussion. Um, might move to Mel next. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa anō. Um, um, thank you very much, um, Andrew. I, I did just have, have one question. Has any of the land for irrigation being tested for its, you know, for how much water it's actually holding. Um, I guess you know, when I look at these, as you, I think you've already noticed, the number of them run through floodplains. There's going to be, we've got high water tables at the Payne Farm. Um, my question is, has the testing actually been done on the land that has been put for for that, that it's actually capable of doing the work you want it to do. Mm. Yep. So as part of the resource consent application back in from 2014 to 2016, some experts were used to assess the both sets of land. Um, to be fair, more detail was done on the Marumbra piece of land than the um, Greytown piece of land. But um, the resource consent reflects the work that was done. And so we have a set application rate at Martinborough, uh, especially particularly on the second piece of land. So yeah, um, and at the time that was designed around the volumes we have to dispose of and what that piece of land can assimilate and the consent was granted on that. But yes, when that set, when each second stage is developed, we will need to do you know another round of um, soil analysis and specific design for those sites. Yeah, within the bounds of the resource consent. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jamie. Any other questions? Um, seeking more clarification about any of the other um, items covered by Wellington Water, um, South Wairapa District Council, or the Greater Regional Council. I 
that um, gets us close to the end of this kind of initial meeting. One key item we did want to raise while we have everyone here is um, the frequency of these CLGs. What, what do people consider would be um, helpful and um, kind of appropriate for this level of engagement? Perhaps first might hear from Rory of what you were kind of contemplating and then there might be whether there's comments from the group of how useful or not that might be. Does that sound okay, Rory? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I think having spoken to the project team, uh, everyone in, uh, involved in this, um, the general feeling was potentially, that depending on the level of engagement we went in detail we went into, would, would half yearly might work better. But in saying that, you know, um, this is the re a bit of a reset for us, it's, you know, um, been the first meeting in a while. So it's, it's a, a bit of a, let's let's see what, um, you know, the majority of CLG members prefer to do. Um, and we're very free, flexible and open to different ideas there. So quarterly, um, the, the consent, uh, I believe, sort of um, sort of initially suggests quarterly, um, but, but there's total flexibility on that. So, yeah, open to input. Um, Mel? Please excuse me, I'm still on mute. Um, I'm just wondering, are you wanting to set how regularly these are, um, are going to be held for the terms of reference? Because, or, or are we just asking at this stage? My, the reason I'm asking is whether there's any capacity for more meetings at a time when there's sort of more things happening so that we can keep engagement going out all the time, um, you know, just to our communities. Uh, like anything, if we bring them along with us, they'll be much more happier than, than being surprised. Um, yeah, and as well, it lets people know what, that, that there's people working, you know, when you hear nothing, the um, people often think nothing's happening. So the more we keep them engaged and that they, they know what's happening, the better. Certainly um, from within Martinborough um, and where we sit as well and within our community. But if we can have more when we need to, is that an option? Does that sound like more quarterly, Mel, at least? At least, at least. Okay, any other views around the group? Um, ben, how about Ben? Ben and Aaron, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I was just about to say, um, I was going to ask Aaron, actually, since he's a compliance officer, if there is a stipulation in the consent conditions that states how often these meetings need to occur. The resource consent, the terms of the reference, terms of reference say that we um, should be meeting in, uh, you know, at, as a baseline quarterly, but the, um, the terms of reference provide flexibility by agreement with the the members of the CLG. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts from around the group? Um, just dive in and unmute yourselves. Um, okay, the next question um, for the follow up meeting, the next CLG. Any key agenda items that people would really like Wellington Water to um, prioritise for that meeting? Mel? So, sorry, everyone, I do apologise um, for, for coming back again. I, um, I, on the next agenda item, one of the things um, and the issues certainly from the Martinborough, um, Martinborough side of it, is that when the ponds were built, they were built for a capacity of, of 1,500 population with an absolute stretch to 2,000 with a 50-year life, uh, life plan, and they were done in 1975. So we're literally uh, coming up to three years within its 50-year lifespan. And 
are the upgrades and things that are going to be done to those treatment ponds, or is there going to be, can we have discussions on, on what is happening? I don't know, like whether the council has decided that they want to, I guess to make us know, make, let us be aware as a group what council's deciding so that we can know what how things are progressing and moving and it's not a surprise so would that be well something like um one item might be the timelines for upgrades yeah yep. any other oh stefan Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, trying to be as helpful as possible about future plans and future investment uh, and is, is good. Uh, that's sensible. And I think we, you know, we want to try and do that. But um, I'm just mindful that we, we don't want to really um, get in the way of normal council process, which is which is where we would where we would normally surface new uh, plans like that and where we would discuss um, information. So, you know, on the basis that it's already been to council and already being decided um, and as part of engagement with the community, um, you know, uh, perhaps that's, that's, you know, that's possible, but I, I just, I'm just sort of wary of the boundaries between what this group does, which is, you know, the operation of existing plants uh, and making sure everyone's happy with those and uh, other processes which relate to future investment decisions, um, which would normally be run through different channels. So if we get confused between those two things, um, then, you know, this, then it might dilute what this meeting is really trying to achieve. Um, and I just felt obliged to just mention that. Thank you. That's um, really helpful comment. Um, sorry, any other, you, any other so, sorry, Andrew, just, just for you. Um, Stefan, I think what I was, was saying was if we could be aware of what decisions are made at council so that as a group we know for, for when we're looking at these, how, how things are progressing. So I wasn't asking for us to make those decisions. I was simply asking that we are made aware of those decisions so that we're all operating in a space of understanding. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Any other um, suggested agenda items people would like to propose? Thank you. We might just move to Rory Milne, um, just to give a very Brief wrap up closing comments or kind of from Wellington Water perspective of you know, what you've heard and where you go next. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think, um, yeah, some, from my perspective, from community engagement and comments, you know, some really good um, stuff to sort of um, carry forward. And, and it's been great to capture a lot of these comments. So, look, I, I think, um, I, I think the team, you know, the team have pretty much covered. Um, I, you know, I think it's been good to go gone to depth for some of the operational side of things and some of the things I'd have jotted down, which were quite interesting around the, you know, we're definitely from a communications perspective, the, the wet wipes, um, we've got promotional work in that space to, edu you know, work with the community, educate the community around, I guess, um, helping the network flow as it should and helping our project team with the work they do. Um, and it, this has really helped me in terms of being able to just just get a feel for what's I know I've had some really good chats with um, Narita as well prior to this meeting about some of the stuff that's important to the community wider than this particular forum but wider catchment issues and um, I think that the part of the value of this is obviously focusing very much on the operations of the of the plant um, but also having an opportunity just to get that initial feedback from the community and whether there's other forums or potential forums that we, we consider users an opportunity to, to share information with the community. And obviously it's been really useful having Greater Wellington Regional Council and, and South Wairarapa District Council to, to share things from their perspective as well. So 
Look, I, I think that's, um, I really appreciate everyone turning up and there's some good conversations, but um, unless there's anything else from, from the project team from our side, um, yeah, really appreciate everyone, everyone's input. Thank you. Um, might move then to um, Tonya to um, close the meeting. Uh, kia ora, Andrew. Uh, kia kara kia tato. Kia hora te marino. Kia whakapapa pōna mu te moana. Kia tere. Ki te karo hirohi. I mua i tau huarahi. Hau i mea i hui e tai ki e. Tai ki e. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> we will see you at the next meeting. Marie. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you. <laughs>